starts the class. Okay, I think we can, uh, we'll move on to the, uh, the next portion of our program. I hope you enjoyed uh, the Religious Liberty Panel, um, and I am fully confident that you will enjoy uh, the next portion of our program, which is uh, Professor Hadley Arcus's keynote address, uh, entitled Containing the Reach of Federal Power, an Appeal to a Remedy Old and New. Um, Professor Hadley Arcus, for many of you, needs no introduction. Um, he, is a, he has been a member of the Amherst faculty since 1966 and uh, as the Edward Knee Professor of Jurisprudence since 1987. Um, but he's most well known perhaps for his engagement in public discourse both through writing and through his speeches. Um, his writings can be found through all the major media networks. Uh, it can also be found in peer-reviewed articles. It can also be found in any sort of website dedicated to public discourse of any kind, uh, the public discourse, whether Witherspoon Institute, uh, Witherspoon Institute's uh, famous online publication, uh, First Things, et cetera. Uh, we are very delighted to have him here uh, because in addition to his writing prowess, he's also a fantastic, engaging speaker. We're delighted to have him here today. Um, <laughs> he's, yeah, characteristic humor as well. Um, and so I, without further ado, Professor Hadley Arcus. Well, after an introduction like that, you know you're going to get up and start stuttering. You know, actually, it reminds me of that cartoon in the New Yorker a long while back of a figure in 19th century garb pointing out to the distance. And next to the pedestal, the people are like ants moving around. And the pedestal says, Soldier, statesman, patriot, author, but still a disappointment to his mother. <laughs> I want to uh, share with you, as they say these days, this item clipped from the New York Times by my friend Mike Ullman uh, from the Metropolitan Diary, sketches of life in the city sent in by readers. And one from a few years back said, went it this way, it said, Dear Diary, it was midway during act three of La Traviata at the New York City Opera. And after witnessing Alfredo's confession of love, Violetta's rejection of the carefree life of Paris, their retreat to the countryside, but George's appeal to release Alfredo for the benefit of his sister's prospects of marriage, Violetta's compliance, her pretended deceit, Alfredo's jealous rage, her reversal, an illness, Giorgio's sympathy, the lover's tragic reunion, and Violetta's death. After all of that, I heard the woman behind me say to her companion, the same thing happened to my girlfriend, Gloria. <laughs> uh, I like to draw on the same blending of the grand and prosaic in offering these, these reflections for you today. And, uh, what I'm going to offer you is not as quite as curly as that, but I'd ask you to stay with me until the last piece falls into place. Um, that the sudden emergence of the Tea Party years ago marked a dramatic new willingness to, uh, in our own time, to take seriously again the limits to the reach of the federal authority. And that emergence was sparked by the uh, crisis over Obamacare with the extension of, possible extension of political control over medical care with vast discretionary powers, powers really over life and death, powers, we'd say, not guided by any standard provided by a statute. This is the administrative state on steroids. And if anything, the problem has been amplified by a president rewriting on his own the laws on immigration and by an administration persistently using its regulatory powers in almost all fields, environmental protection agency, National Labor Relations Board, Fannie Mae, to detach itself from the restraints of the statutes that provide its authority to govern. That old, old question of government of limited powers has been overborne now or brought into a, a kind of a jarring new dimension by the executive power radically uncontained. The remarkable thing is why it took so long, why it took Barack Obama to reveal to us what should have been evident long ago. That is, the Madisonian system, 
made it harder to legislate by making it harder to assemble a majority in a plural body, and that same system makes it hard in the same way to assemble a majority, to summon a, the cohesion of a plural body, to resist the president who may be extending his powers. And that task could become nearly impossible when a large portion of the Congress was filled by members of the president's own party with a stake in defending the president and in that way amplifying his own power to veto what the Congress may produce in offering resistance, something not contemplated fully by the founders. Uh, still, um, these expansive possibilities that were latent in the executive power all along uh, were simply not as astounding when the federal government just didn't do as much. Uh, there was a certain time, after all, when the federal presence in any community was marked most critically by the presence of the post office. Now, with the flaring of the Tea Party, we heard again some familiar calls of, to take seriously again the notion of a government of enumerated powers and enumerated ends. Now, my late professor, Morton Grodzitz, at the University of Chicago, was one of the great defenders of federalism, and he argued that that there was no organizing principle that explained how functions or powers were assigned in this system, local or federal. And he argued if the functions of the government were assigned by some measure of naturalness or fit, the local governments could be left with nothing to do. And even Justice Blackman, in one of his rare moments of lucidity, um, in, in, the, in, in the Garcia case, uh, in the 1980s recognized that there was no such clear organizing principle that could explain, for example, why operating a municipal airport, airport and disposing of solid waste were functions of local government while regulating intrastate sales of natural gas or in-house domestic services for the aged and handicapped should be functions of the federal government. Now, I would post uh, this caution, that as we get drawn off, trying to find that list of enumerated powers and ends will be deflected to a mirage which will keep dissolving the closer we get to it. Just why that list of enumerated ends proves futile is a matter rooted in the logic of moral judgment itself, I'd argue, and on that more in a moment. But we might take as a telling point that commentary offered by Hamilton in the Federalist 33 on the limits of the federal authority. And of course, you know, there's no one who had a more expansive view of the reach of the national government than Hamilton. But in the Federalist 33, he offered two subjects which he thought just inconceivable that the federal government could touch. Suppose he said that by some forced construction of its authority, the federal government should attempt to vary the law of descent or inheritance in any state, or should undertake to abrogate a land tax imposed by the authority of a state. He thought these would be the plainest violations of the authority confirmed to the states. Uh, but we've already seen that the uh, local laws governing inheritance have been challenged successfully on ground of discrimination based on gender, right? Reed versus Reed. And the challenge to taxes on real estate have been hovering for a long while. But that is the possibility of the charge of um, violating the Equal Protection Clause by creating serious disparities in the funding of schools by relying on the property tax. That's been hovering for a long while. And if we had a real estate tax containing a covert discrimination on the base of race, would anyone have the slightest doubt that this local tax could become the business of a federal court and through that, the business of the federal government. John Marshall actually lifted the curtain on this a long while ago in the old Dartmouth College case you know, in 1819 when he raised the question, what if, what if a legislature passed a law that dissolved contracts of marriage without the consent of the contracting parties? Could that possibly pose a serious question under the contracts clause? Article 1, Section 10. Well, but that cause didn't exactly rise that day. So sufficient does, unto the day is the evil thereof, we needn't reach that question, right? But years later, we'd have Dred, the Dred Scott case, and Justice Curtis in dissent would indeed invoke the, the 
the contracts clause. Tread and Harriet were married in free territory. Would that marriage be dissolved now that they were moved back to Missouri and returned to a condition of slavery? John Marshall had lifted the curtain, and the point to be glimpsed was this. There may be no subject more local um, than, uh, than these laws on marriage, but there may be no subject so local that it may not come into conflict with principles so woven in the Constitution that they form part of the fundamental law. There's been nothing more characteristic of a jurisdiction distinctly local than the laws on marriage of the family. And yet Marshall intimated that something in those laws could raise issues engaging the fundamental law of the Constitution. In the 20th century, we'd find, of course, the Supreme Court reviewing the aspects of marriage, finally striking down the ban on interracial marriage in Loving versus Virginia, 1967. And in the 1980s, we found the recognition finally breaking through that the Constitution would surely have a bearing on the grounds in which the courts were assigning the custody of children in, of divorce in interracial marriages. We found good liberal judge Alex Holtzoff in, my, my, in DC saying, well, we, we know that to be identified with a black parent is to be identified with people who are less well off. So on the basis of race, you found certain people deprived of custody of their children. The lesson emerging here was that there was no matter so local, so prosaic, that it cannot touch issues that engage the principles of the fundamental law. And that, curiously, brings me back to Kant. Uh, of course, I, almost everything brings me back to Aristotle and Kant. And uh, I think that old Jack Carson line, he says, I use, I, take, I use gin for a cold, but then again, I use gin for just about everything. Um, he said, in, a, in another account, of the categorical imperative, Kant remarked that for every act animated by desire or intention, there's a certain class of those acts that one ought not do. I said, really? For every class? I mean, aren't there certain things that are quite morally indifferent? I could choose the bingo over Beethoven. I could choose the peanut butter over the cock of van. My, my, my choice might reveal a sensibility uh, less refined, but surely I wouldn't be doing anything morally wrong. And yet, we would rule out, in the matter of cuisine, we would rule out, as Flanders and Swan used to say, the roast leg of insurance salesmen. Um, even in the field of cuisine, there are certain choices that could be deeply wrongful and which we could be rightly barred from choosing. What Kant evidently saw here was this, that there was nothing we can name, no thing, no activity, that cannot be part of a means-ends chain leading to a harm that's inflicted without justification. The skill of driving may be used to drive an ambulance or drive a, a getaway car for the mafia. I could hit golf balls through my neighbor's window. The point bearing on the Constitution would be this. What we discover in putting together Kant and John Marshall is that there is no subject so prosaic that it cannot offer the occasion of harms or wrongs that involve a violation of the principles contained in the fundamental law of the Constitution. If the assigning of custody for children after divorce, if that can become the business of the federal courts, it becomes in a stroke the business of the federal government. It could become the business then of the federal legislature. On that in a moment, too. Alexander Hamilton understood that a limited government meant a government limited to its rightful ends. The limits were to be found not by making a list, but in understanding the boundaries between the rightful and wrongful ends of government and the rightful and wrongful uses of power. Plato famously said that a man with self-control as a constitutional order within himself. A man with self-control was not a weaker man, but a stronger man because he could concentrate his powers on the things rightful for him to do. The understanding of a constitutional order may be drawn from the same sense of a moral agent, a person 
with agentic powers, the powers of a moral agent, guided by his reasoning over his rightful and wrongful ends. The limits of the government depended on our capacity to reason over the extensions of power that were justified or unjustified, legitimate or illegitimate. They depended on the canons of moral reason, the canons that are used every day by ordinary folk. The fire department blocks my progress trying to walk down the street because they're fighting a fire in my neighborhood. My liberty has been impeded. My natural rights have not been abridged, or my constitutional rights. This is such a patent justification for that restriction directed to my safety and the safety of others. I see a youngster going into the subway on Connecticut Avenue, D.C., with a bicycle. I said, you could do that? He said, yes, but not during rush hour. He understands when his liberty may be quite rightly restricted. Now, the founders understood that we'd never be without this kind of moral reasoning. And it would indeed be needed every day in understanding what our claims were under the Constitution. They didn't think they had to supply those principles of judgment in the text of the Constitution. But the Constitution was directed to another purpose, establishing a structure of government consistent with the principles that marked the character of this regime, the regime that took its founding principle, as Lincoln thought in, all men are created equal, the only rightful government over human beings is that which draws its rightful authority from the consent of the governed. But the Constitution was understood as a structure shaped to the end of securing rights. Our friend Justice Scalia has pointed out that if we look for the securing of rights in a list of rights set down in the Constitution, there would be no polity with more rights than the late Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had a long list, but what it didn't have is a structure for securing those rights. Uh, the structure in the United States consisted mainly of a political people armed with a vote in free elections. As you know, it wasn't until 1925 that the Supreme Court began to apply the First Amendment to the states. If we asked what protected our freedoms before that, the answer was a people armed with a vote and willing to remove politicians who posed a threat to those freedoms. It wasn't until 1964 in Times versus Solomon that the Supreme Court intimated that the old Alien and Sedition Acts might have been unconstitutional. But those acts were defeated politically with the revolution at the polls in 1800 and with the ascent of Jefferson and his party. Now, I'd suggest in a similar way that the remedy to our problems today with the extension of the federal power has the best chance of being met if we secure our remedy in the same way with the structure of the Constitution. The Constitution itself mentions only a couple of principles, ex post facto laws, bills of attainder, impairing the obligation of contracts. And yet there is a moral logic, there's a moral logic implicit in the structure of the Constitution and the separation of powers. And what I want to argue to you today is that this structure is the source of some of the most useful levers that would work to restrain the federal power. The key, I think, comes in recovering the moral logic behind that structure it's a matter, I think, of drawing on the deep moral premises in the separation of powers and also recovering in the conservative political class the sense of how to play the political game, again, in a delicious way, by engaging those old moral rules. One of the striking things here is that even some of our own favorite jurists separating the separation of powers seem to neglect. They seem to put their accent on the danger of concentrating powers, and yet they curiously miss the deeper moral logic contained in the separation of powers, the logic caught so notably by Locke in the second treatise, when he put it in this way. In well-ordered commonwealths, where the good of the whole is considered as it ought, the legislative power is put in the hands of diverse persons who have by themselves, or jointly with others, a power to make laws which, when they have done, which, when they have done, being separated again, they are themselves subject to the law they have made. 
which is a new and near tie upon them to take care. They make them for the public good. Translation, the structure of power works to impart this caution to those who legislate. You'd better be careful in the laws you frame because you will not be given the authority to prosecute under those laws. Once you've passed this bill into law, that law will be put in the hands of others, perhaps the hands of people quite unfriendly to you. So you'd better take care not to legislate for others what you'd not be willing to see applied with its full force against yourself. In other words, the separation of powers in this understanding is simply a way of rendering operational what the philosophers call the universalizability principle, or perhaps you might call the categorical imperative. It puts the question of what is the principle behind one's position, and whether you'd be willing to respect the same principle when it cuts against your own interests. This is a formal principle, but it works with notable substantive effects. Democrats summoned a high enthusiasm for the independent council when it was loosed with all of its terrors on members of the Reagan administration. But when the powers of that office were concentrated on Bill Clinton, the Democrats quickly lost their appetite for that novelty, and it was allowed to lapse. A Democratic House passed articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon for, among other things, suborning perjury. It was proved 25 years later that President Clinton had suborned perjury. Bill Bennett and I did a piece in the Wall Street Journal simply raising the question whether the rules laid down for the impeachment of President Nixon were still there to be respected and applied. In other words, were the Democrats now willing to apply to themselves the laws they were pleased to legislate for others. One of the key faults in the conservative party is that it's persistently shied away from the demand that the liberal party respect the moral logic of the Constitution by living under the laws they lay down for others. And so Harry Reid finally uses the nuclear option that the Republicans were reluctant to use when they controlled the Senate. The purpose was to pack the DC Circuit Court in order to ward off challenges to Obamacare and then we find the Republicans coming back in with key staffers wanting to restore the traditions of the Senate in allowing filibusters on appointments to the court. And that argument's going on even today. Now there may be something quite useful in that tradition, but it should wait until the Republicans give Democrats a severe lesson first in living under the rules they crafted. For nothing, no lectures on the Constitution are more likely to deliver the Liberal Party from changing the rules when it suits their convenience. We find ourselves simply restating here one of the most rudimentary moral points in the rule of law, that people, even rulers, should be governed by the same law they lay down for others. They may not twist the law as it suits their interests, and there's a logical connection there to that other maxim that a man should not be a judge in his own cause. That maxim is one of three or four that can explain about 60% or more of the structure of the Constitution. You recall this. Uh, a dispute between two states may not be held in the courts of one of the embattled states. It should move into a more detached form of a federal court. And in the same way, proceeding in bankruptcy with creditors from different states should also move into the more neutral form of a federal court. But as with anything, we may find ourselves backing into a violation of this underlying principle without quite noticing it. This is which is why Justice Sutherland posted the warning in one instance many years ago that anyone who confuses a government with a business does not understand the nature of either one. Let's see. The government is the authority that makes the rules under which legitimate commerce may be conducted, but the government itself may not be a player under those same rules. For the government got into the project of sinking public monies into private businesses, trying to pick winners and losers by offering subsidies to favored industries, there would be an irresistible temptation to guard that public investment by tilting the field with discriminatory tariffs and taxes. And sure enough, just last month, we were given a concrete lesson here. The Obama administration has been high on subsidies for solar energy, 
and companies making solar panels. And as with many other things, those companies have been undercut in their prices by Chinese products. And so the government, just this last December, um, slapped on duties ranging from 26 to 78 percent on solar panels made in China. And of course, the argument was made that the Chinese products themselves are subsidized. But the American position would be far more compelling if there wasn't a hint of putting on duties to cover the investment of our own government with the government sinking public monies into these things. We still don't know just where the President of the United States acquired the authority to cashier the President of General Motors. It ended. But that had something to do with the fact that the government was putting money in to bail out General Motors and acquiring stock along the way. And it would be salutary to remind ourselves that it has not always been thus. This is not a practice arising out of the very nature of this government. James Grant, in his new book, The Forgotten Depression, about the Depression of 1920 and 21, recalls how readily the United States recovered and prospered after that very deep recession following the First World War, and recovered more readily precisely because the government was not involved in schemes to bail out private companies and put its weight on the scales. People here will no doubt recall Madison's argument in the Federalist 51 that it would be very useful to forge a connection between the interests of the person and the interests of the place, between make private interests work for public good. A president seeking to protect himself may also be protecting the powers of the executive. What I'm arguing here is that political interests may be connected to the principles of regime of law by the willingness, persistently, to make the other side live under the laws it would set down for others. Some of us have made it our vocation to test the coherence of different principles or theories of the Constitution, but it should never surprise surprise conservatives, that the liberal side will not be swayed by arguments as much as the moves that apply liberal principles in a way that threatens the things that the left cares about most deeply. And so nothing has driven the extension of federal power more than the Commerce Clause allied with the spending powers. We've had ample arguments to show what is implausible about the reach given to the Commerce Clause beginning with the New Deal. It should have been quite enough to have invoked Justice McReynolds in Jones versus McLaughlin back in 1937 when the pivot was made. McReynolds raised these questions, testing the logic of this new extended reach. And he said, may a mill owner be prohibited from closing his factory or discontinuing his business? because that would stop the flow of his products and the flow of commerce? May employees in a factory be barred from quitting work because that will stop the production and flow of commerce? And if the business cannot continue without the existing weight, with, with the existing weight scale, may Congress command a reduction in wages? But as we've seen again and again, the Liberal Party and its lawyers are not deterred by questions of this kind, the challenge of the very coherence of their position, it would make a more profound difference when these extended laws come to tread again upon freedoms that the Liberal Party cares about. And there's none that is cared about more deeply of late than the right to abortion. That right is now taken on the standing of a first principle, an anchor to personal freedom, perhaps even more important than freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Jurists will throw over the doctrines and theories of a lifetime when it collides with that interest. I was in the courtroom that day, 1986, when Thurgood Marshall discovered states' rights. <laughs> when, it, when it was going to collide with the interest of the Reagan administration getting access to the records of Baby Doe in Long Island to find out why was, why was medical care withheld from this child. He saw this threatening the whole corpus of rights of privacy emanating from Roe versus Wade. And so back in the 90s, I, a speech I gave to the Supreme Court Historical Society, as it turned out that Mr. Rehnquist was introducing me that night, I sought to show that the reigning commerce doctrines of the Commerce Clause, and especially Wickard versus Filburn, the case dear to you all, I'm sure, Wickard, 
all this could have the application to this matter of abortion. In Wickard, as you may, some of you may recall, um, Justice Jackson showed us how an activity, innocent in itself, could somehow become a matter of wrongdoing when it was replicated many times over. So Roscoe Filbert was sitting, simply setting aside a portion of wheat and his farm for domestic production. But as Jackson, quote, explained, that the appellee's own contribution may be trivial in itself, is not enough to remove him from the scope of the federal regulation. Whereas here, his contribution, taken together with that of many others, is far from trivial. And so I submit to you, it's well within the same logic to explain in the same way, this singular private abortion may be yours alone, but when it is taken together with 1.2 million abortions every year, it is having the most profound effect on the interstate commerce, not only in the market for baby food, bassinets, diapers, toys, but for bar mitzvahs, college tuitions, weddings, and finally, 1.2 million taxpayers coming on online every year to support Social Security and the system of welfare. If Wickard versus Filbert is plausible, I submit to you this argument flows quite as well. And clearly, abortion irreparably, irreparably interferes with the freedom of the fetus to travel in interstate commerce. Well, of course, we don't think any of our Republican Republicans would have the imagination or the nerve to make that kind of an argument, yet it could be made another way quite gently and quite easily. We passed a dozen years ago the most modest step in legislating on abortion, the bill to protect the child who survived an abortion, the so-called Born Alive Infants Protection Act. That was my baby, and I tell the story of it in that little red book that he has there, that handsome book that's used all over Chicago by my family as a coaster to put under drinks. <laughs> Uh, I, was invited, I was invited to the signing of that bill by President Bush, and I had an email shortly after from Karl Rove saying, that was so simple and so elegant. Do you have anything more in the drawer? Like, I said, are you kidding? Of course. Um, I pointed out that the courts at the time were simply enjoining the bill that barred the surgery called partial birth abortion. But that left open the concern that the American people could be drawn in as accomplices in a procedure they regarded as abhorrent, they could be drawn in through the nexus of the tax system in paying for those procedures. It was entirely possible for Congress to come forward with a bill simply insisting that no federal funds would be expended in any hospital or clinic that houses the partial birth abortion. And we could readily add, of course, for my own bill, the live birth abortion where the child is simply born alive and put in the refuse room to die. Now, I suggested also that the president could have a notable effect simply by raising the question with the Judiciary Committee of whether, uh, in either house, whether the formulas of the Civil Rights Restoration Act would apply. Some of you may remember, a youngster has a, a loan from the federal government, takes it to Georgetown, and all federal regulations come into play. So we'd ask, simply have him ask, if any person entering a clinic is receiving a social security check, a pension from the military, a refund from the IRS. Is the whole facility now a recipient of federal funds? Just posing the question would introduce some crippling tensions within the Liberal Party, as levers in the law brought forth by the Liberal side would now be posed very powerfully against, right against them. And that goes even more for the performance of abortion itself. If the Congress can refuse to pay for partial birth abortions, it may refuse as well to pay for abortions after 20 weeks, or abortions performed for sex selection, or abortions performed after the first evidence of a beating heart. Which is to say, if this step were allowed, Congress could effectively legislate to scale down that right to abortion. It could legislate without technically legislating. This is the whole scheme of legislating by indirection. We simply give federal grants, and if you accept the money, then the rules come around, but if you don't accept the money, the rules are not binding, there is strictly no legislation. Okay? And yet the very prospect of withholding or withdrawing federal funds has a powerful effect. I'm told, and I think it was confirmed by Professor Field this morning, it's hard to find a hospital that does not get a, a large portion of its money 
from the federal government, perhaps even through Medicare and Medicaid. If a Republican administration in Congress came forward with this proposal, it would set off crippling tensions within the Liberal Party. But more than that, the Liberal Party would have to resist. First, the whole right to abortion could be legislated away. And in order to resist that, they would have to start putting in place some rules on reining in or even barring the extension of federal rules that come along with federal money. So as I made my case to Karl Rove, I said, look, if the Democrats really want to resist and they're really willing to start dismantling this whole system by which the federal authority has been extended over the last 50 years, we'll tell them, we'll help them. Fine, we'll help them. I said, for us, it's a win-win proposition. So just do it. And it did not even require an executive order. It simply required a political executive with a political sense, with a relish for playing the political game and fostering tensions on the other side, mainly facing the Liberal Party with the need to pay a price that matters to them as the price for living under the rules and the regime they fashioned over 50 years. We can take that subject of abortion to reach, finally, the last piece I would put into place here, the most important proposal I would put before you today. It's one of the simplest, drawing on a classic opinion by John Marshall. It's drawn, once again, from the underlying logic of the separation of powers, and therefore it's a structural argument, the kind of argument that should have enlisted the deepest convictions of lawyers who gather under the banner of the Federalist Society. And if the political class could simply to recover Marshall's understanding here, it would have, I think you would see, it would have had the most profound effect on the tone and substance of our politics. It's also something that we sought to state again as part of our statute for the, as a preamble to the Born Alive Infants Protection Act. As we sought as the times passed at a preamble putting in the premises and the purposes of the bill. We have a chance perhaps to do this again. So as part of the preamble, we sought to put in that argument made by John Marshall in the classic case of Cohen's versus Virginia. I hope that many of you have read here. Marshall argued there that the judicial power of every well-constituted government must be coextensive with the legis coextensive with the legislative, must be capable of deciding every judicial question which grows out of the Constitution and the laws. And yet even jurists are persistently surprised by the corollary of that axiom, namely that the legislative power must be coextensive with the judicial power. Any issue that comes within the competence of the federal judiciary must come presumptively at least within the reach of the federal legislature and the federal executive. For how is it possible that the federal courts are competent to address abortion in all of its dimensions while the doctors of law ponder deeply over the question of whether Congress may legislate on the same subject. And so what we propose as part of our bill, which we may do again, is to add this, that if the court, Supreme Court, can articulate new rights under the Constitution, if it can find, say, a right to abortion in the 14th Amendment, the legislative branch must be empowered to vindicate that same right in the same under the same clause in the Constitution where the court professed to find it and in filling them out, marking its limits. To say in this case, whatever Roe versus Wade meant, it certainly could mean the right to kill a child who survived an abortion. You couldn't have meant that, could you? The one thing we said that should not be tenable under this Constitution is that the court can articulate new rights and then assign to itself a monopoly of the legislative power in defining those rights. Now to deny that proposition is to remove the Supreme Court from the web of restraints that mark the character and logic of the separation of powers. Just before Roe versus Wade, in the presidential campaign of 1972, 
George McGovern sought to evade the question by saying abortion was distinctly a matter of local law. The federal government should have nothing to do with it. And I did a piece of time raising the question whether he meant also then the federal courts should have nothing to do with it. Because the federal courts are now striking down laws on abortion in the states. Or was it simply that the federal courts were curiously never seen as parts of the federal government? Somehow screened out. And yet it was the Supreme Court that converted abortion overnight into an issue of our national politics by creating a new right anchored in the Constitution. And the strange thing is that this screening is still in place. That just as the federal courts are not seen as part of the national constitution, national government, the Supreme Court is removed from the constraints of the separation of powers. But it doesn't take much imagination to see how this whole issue would have been transformed if our political class and if our judges had understood from the very beginning Marshall's argument in Cohen's versus Virginia. First, it would have been salutary for the judges to understand that once they introduced abortion as a constitutional right and made it overnight into an issue of national politics, they could not keep control of that issue themselves. They couldn't keep a monopoly of control of it. If Congress had to weigh in on this matter of 1973, it's fairly clear as to what would have happened. The right to abortion would have been scaled down to essentially where it was in most of the states at the time and where most people would have it today. A right to abortion when the life of the mother is endangered, a vanishingly small number of cases today, and if some liberal states, New York, California, Hawaii, would be, have far more liberal provision. But in that case, the hearings to confirmations of the court would not have turned into the poisonous affairs they become, poisoning not only our, the hearings but our national politics as well. The issue of abortion might not have become the central defining issue for one of our parties, creating a new division in our politics, not based on class but based on the culture war, abortion, contraception, gay rights, same-sex marriage. But even more critically, there would not have been a need for vast throngs of people filling the streets in Washington in the cold of January, for there would have been no need to seek the overruling of Roe, no need to keep affirming the supremacy of the Supreme Court in reshaping our lives and our institutions, for the court would not have that supremacy. As I say, we stated this point in the form of a preamble. It does not require an enactment of Congress or a constitutional amendment, for it's simply implicit in the logic of the separation of powers. It could be quite important to have a statement made in a public document for the sake of raising the point to kind of a public awareness again. But what this requires is one of those occasions where people hear the line and realize They've known it all along. It's like Lincoln saying, as I would not be a slave, I would not be a master. Since I reject the relation in principle, my rejection is utterly indifferent to whether I stand on the advantage or the disadvantaged side of it. People hear it and say, of course, yes, yes. It's that's the sort of thing I had in mind. I used to invoke at times like this Plato t teaching in the Mino that all knowledge is a matter of remembering, a matter of unlocking or drawing out what's already contained within us, the implications that are tucked away in the things you already know. And so once again, we may find ourselves saying that for this country, with the impressive writings and jurisprudence of the founding, it's a matter mainly of remembering what our own lawyers and judges and our own people once used to know. Thank you. Let's let's thank Professor Argus one more time. That was tremendous.
and I, I think we, we should note, we should, I want it noted that if the revolution begins, that it was here on Ronald Reagan's birthday at the Penn, Penn, University of Pennsylvania Law School, Federal Society of Ed. We are the, this will be the start of the federal remedy. So thank you very much, Professor Arcus. Yes, yes, we've come full circle. Um, so uh, one, one of the things I loved about that speech was its interest in the underlying philosophical principles of the Constitution. And of course, uh, Professor Arcus's uh, James Wilson Institute is devoted to the study of that and the promotion of those ideas, those principles that we already know, um, but perhaps don't realize. And, uh, and you'll see on all your tables brochures for the James Wilson Institute. There's also a table back there, uh, and you can see Garrett at any time to find out more information about Professor Arcus's institute, uh, the programs he's put together, lectures. Uh, it's a tremendous resource, and I encourage uh, especially the students here to take advantage of it and find out more about it. Uh, well, that, would c that concludes our lunch program. Uh, we'll probably start the, we'll start the panel in about 10 minutes, um, the election law panel. Uh, so if you could kindly, uh, you know, gather your things. Uh, we have trash receptacles in the back there, and uh, I will see you in about 10 minutes in the other room. <laughs>